They're all in line, and we're ready for the start. They're off in the Belmont Stakes. Not a great start for American Pharaoh, but he will be set to the lead by Victor Espinosa, so he waits no longer. over them which is the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon the strength of the global private sector, with trillions at its disposal, far beyond global GDP, and with the greatest respect, beyond even the governments of the world's leaders, it offers the only real prospect of achieving fundamental economic transition. Right to the front for American Pharaoh in the race to the first turn, but he did not come out of the gate all that well. Frosted is away running in second position, Materiality is third to the outside. A ground saving run for Mubtahij, who's right behind American Pharaoh into that first turn that made from Lucky. Keen Ice, Kayla Verve, and the trailer is from Ento. The opening quarter mile was 24 seconds flat. A sensible fraction for American Pharaoh, who leads the way on that sweeping first turn here at Belmont Park. Here at Belmont Park. 
Tens of thousands of people have attended a mass held by Pope Francis at Marseille's Velodrome Stadium. The pontiff was in the port city to preside over the closing session at a gathering of Catholic bishops from the Mediterranean area. Earlier, the Pope challenged French President Emmanuel Macron and other European leaders on their immigration policies. He called on governments to deal with the issue humanely. Clearly, he's leaving us a code. This is the world you are graduating into. This is what I want to talk about today with you for a few minutes. To lead in shaping a new world order for the 21st century. The Vatican has confirmed that Pope Francis will participate in the Mediterranean meetings in Marseille, France. Bishops from all over the region will come together on September 22nd and 23rd. President Macron is expected to receive the Pope. However, as Pope Francis has said on other occasions, it will not be an official visit as Vatican head of state to France. The migratory crisis has consistently been one of the topics of discussion during these meetings. In 2020, it was held in Bari.
Trovo significativa la scelta di tenere questo incontro nella città di Bari, così importante per i legami che intrattiene con il Medio Oriente come con il continente africano. The last meeting of the Mediterranean bishops was held in Florence in February 2022, but Pope Francis was unable to attend due to his knee problems. This papal trip will mark a historic milestone for Marseille because Francis will be the second pope to visit after Clement VII in 1533. So the first issue comes out November 22nd, 2017, and then it's a 12-issue series. It's unlike any story that I've ever written. It's unlike any story that Gary's ever drawn. The last comic book I wrote was DC Universe Rebirth number one. There's a piece of that book that that relates to the story Doomsday Clock that I'm doing with Gary Frank and Brad Anderson. And that is, we hinted that somebody had been messing with time. Somebody's experimenting with time in, in the DC Universe. And we reveal a hint that that is Dr. Manhattan. There was kind of a temporal anomaly in uh, the Batcave, a chronal explosion, and there was an object that came out of it. And Batman uncovered it, he pried it loose from this cavern wall, and as he pulled it out, the big image was Batman holding comedian's smiley face button. When the seed of the idea started to happen uh, in my head, and I talked to Gary about it, Gary Frank about it, that Dr. Manhattan would be this character and would intersect with the DC Universe in a very subtle way at the end of the Rebirth special, both of us were rightly so nervous about it. I think there's a real slippery slope of just saying, oh, let's have Rorschach and Batman have a fist fight. We're not interested in just kind of having some funny mashup because that's not what we're doing. What we're trying to do is take the philosophy and the tones and the thematics of Watchmen and some of the subjects they dealt with. And Watchmen has a very specific thematic and, and uh, viewpoint and the DC Universe has several, but ultimately one and we talked a lot about what that would look like in 2016, that in November the election happened in, in the U.S. and then a lot of other things happened in the world and I was looking at everything and I reread Watchmen and suddenly one day the story just, it was in my head. Today we move the clock a half minute closer to midnight. Nuclear volatility has been and continues to be the order of the day. To step back further from the brink will require leaders who have both vision and restraint. President Trump and President Putin, who claim great respect for each other, can choose to act together as statesmen or act as petulant children, risking our future. And I called Gary Frank and I said, okay, Gary, I think I have the story. And he was like, okay, let, let me hear it. And I pitched it to him and he said, I have to draw the story. The book is, and Gary and I have studied Watchmen and looked at Watchmen and read it and, and of course love it. And we want to do our own thing, but at the same time you want to play into some of the structural tenets that that book created and some of the dynamics and some of the tones it created. And so although we have a book that is very, I think, dramatic and mysterious and intriguing, it's also a little quirky. The characters are a little off, the characters that we're playing with. And it'll be very apparent in issue one. There's a, there's a bit of humor to it, I think, in a very odd way. But our main word, if there's one word for it, is thought-provoking. 
and we want people to think about it. They can think about it in fun ways, they can think about it in serious ways, but whatever's happening when they're reading the book and they're in the book, or when they reread the book, that they'll really just think. King Charles and Queen Camilla have kicked off a three-day state visit to France. French President Macron welcomed the pair earlier today. The royal couple and President Macron and his wife attended a wreath-laying ceremony at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Paris. King Charles and Macron held a bilateral meeting afterwards. The king's trip to France was initially planned for March, but was postponed due to nationwide protest over the country's new pension reform law. the national anthem of the Holy See, followed by the national anthem of the United States. Hi, for one, I'm glad we're stuck with civilization, and I think we will be for a long, long time. <laughs> so? Yeah, so? Dude, The Simpsons done everything already. Who cares? Just keeping you on your toes, babe. <gasps> 239 pounds! Oh, I'm a blimp. Why are all the good things so tasty? <laughs> You can do it, old boy. Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> diddly, diddly. <coughs> That's a higher power than even I believe in. What is going on? I am proud to honor the players of the Negro Leagues of Rollerball. And as we strive for the desegregation of all death sports, we cannot help but be inspired by... Ed's... Ugh. So? Yeah, so? Dude, The Simpsons done everything already, who cares? This is the end of your world, and the beginning of mine. Now look on a military clock, 9-11. Okay, if you go around again, the next event will be on 9, go around to the 11, but on a military clock, it's 23, 2300 hours. So 9-11 was a major event. The next event will happen. I have no idea of the year. 
Um, I, I don't know that time, but I, I know that 923 is the next go around. your world. They must be stopped at all costs. Gaius Octavius, better known as Augustus Caesar, was born into nobility on September 23, 63 BC, although he never recognized the title of emperor. Augustus Caesar was the first of the ruling Julio-Claudian dynasty to reign in Rome. Before Augustus's centralization of power, Rome was ruled by a series of suffects, but Augustus changed that entire system becoming the sole ruler. His family, the Julians, gave birth to some of the greatest tyrants the world had ever seen, including the merciless Caligula and the mentally insane Nero. Members of the Julio-Claudian dynasty believed themselves to be descendants of another race from the Dawn Star, also known as the Venus. Members of this dynasty were so convinced that they descended from this otherworldly race that they would actually dress up as the goddess Venus. Even the ruthless Caligula would cross-dress and put on women's garbs that made him look like a goddess. But it all started with Caesar Augustus, born on September 23rd, 63 BC, who would adopt the title Divi Filius, which means Son of God. The 21st century world order, based on the perennial principles we established together after World War II. The only option then is to strengthen our cooperation we can build the 21st century world order based on a new breed of multilateralism, based on a more effective, accountable, and results-oriented multilateralism. I believe the United States and the European Union should cooperate to find the right balance between innovation and ethics and harness the best of today's revolutions in digital data and artificial intelligence. I believe in these rights and values. I believe that against ignorance, we have education. Against inequalities, development. Against cynicism, trust and good faith. Against fanaticism, culture, 
against disease and epidemics, medicine, against the threats on the planet, science. And this containment, I mentioned in one of these pillars, is necessary in Yemen, in Lebanon, in Iraq, and also in Syria. What we cherish is at stake. What we love is in danger. We have no choice but to prevail. And together, we shall prevail. I don't like what you did in front of me. Go out, outside. I'm sorry, but we know the rules. Nobody, nobody has to prolong. Nobody, okay? We keep calm. Please respect the rules as they are for centuries. They will not change with me. I can tell you, okay? You want me to go back to my plane and go back to France? Is that what you want? This is not a method. This is a provocation. That is provocation. It's not a provocation. Please, you stop now. I don't want people with arms in France. No, I wait. Pope Francis and French President Emmanuel Macron hold private talks at the Vatican today with European tensions over migrants as a key issue. The two exchanged gifts. The Pope gave Macron a Medal of St. Martin of Tours and the French President gave him a 1949 edition of a novel by a Catholic writer. After the meeting, which lasted longer than expected, Macron put a hand on Francis' shoulder and kissed him. The Holy Father reciprocated the warmth, shaking the French leader's hand as they departed. For more on the meeting, we go to Vatican correspondent Juliet Lindley, who joins us from Rome. Juliet, the two leaders met for almost one hour in the Apostolic Palace's library. What was the atmosphere like and what were the talks focused on? Why the meeting lasted twice as long as Pope Francis' meeting with President Trump a year ago. And it was even longer than the meeting with then-President Barack Obama in 2014. And France's controversial bioethics law was the focus of the talks, what changes could be made in accordance with the teachings of the church. Now also on the agenda were migration issues and Europe's migration crisis. Uh, the fact that Macron came, met the Pope, but did not meet the head of government, uh, Giuseppe Conte, the Prime Minister, the new Prime Minister, would highlight if we want the tensions between Paris and Rome currently on recent migration issues. So I had a lot on the agenda and perhaps no surprise that Macron spent almost one hour with the Holy Father today. And after his meeting with the Holy Father, President Macron went to the Basilica of St. John Lateran for a traditional ceremony, usually reserved for French heads of state. During that ceremony, he received an honorary title. Tell us more about the event and about that title. Why, the title is first and only honorary canon of the Archbasilica of St. John Lateran, which is the Pope's cathedral here in Rome, as you know. And it's a medieval tradition. It dates back to the French king Louis XI in 1482, and especially from the time of King Henry IV in the late 1500s. Most recently, it was renewed in the 50s. Now, some former presidents of France have received the title, but others have declined, and that would include uh, Macron's predecessor, French President François Hollande, who is a self declared atheist. Now, in spite of France's secular history since the 1789 French Revolution, um, in receiving the title, Macron actually chose to continue this centuries-long tradition. 
Juliet, we hear a lot about French society being increasingly secularized. What is the role of the church in France today, and what relationship does Macron himself have with his faith? Well, indeed, France is strictly secular under a landmark law from 1905 that separates the state from the church. But it remains one of the country's most debated rules. And in fact, in April, just a few months ago, Macron made headlines when he said that he wanted to repair the bond between church and state. And in fact, his acceptance today of the honorary canon title was met with a certain amount of a skepticism in the French press. Some observers say it might be an electoral move, given that uh, Catholicism is still France's biggest religion and many faithful worry the nation has distanced itself too much from its Christian roots. Now just for some background Wyatt, uh, Macron chose to be baptized at the age of 12, uh, apparently against his parents wishes and he had a Jesuit education. However, despite his Catholic background, he's been known to describe himself as an agnostic. Freemasonry in France goes way back in time. You can see Napoleon with the Masonic symbol here, the hidden hand. There's a Masonic Lodge in France. Pretty creepy. You got the moon and the sun over the all seeing eye. And this is a mockery of God. You know, in the Bible, God is watching over us. And Satanists like to imitate, to counterfeit God with the all seeing eye watching over us. Now, this is a bit off topic. But I want to play a clip from this song from the Alan Parsons Project called Eye in the Sky. And what do you see here? Behind them, the Eye of Lucifer. Again, the Eye in the Sky. Take a listen to some of this here. The lyrics from this song, the occultic meaning. You know, a lot of these songs, they sound sweet to the ears, but that's part of the deception. Take a listen to this part of the song here. It's very relevant. How the whole world is staged, and these are minions of Satan and those that control this world. the eye in the sky I can read your mind and I can cheat you blind and that's a reference to their false god like I said Satan their eye in the sky complete mockery of God now getting back on subject with the French Freemasonry connection old poster showing Balfamet you go right there some more imagery here now understand the Again, the French connection, of course, when the U.S. was established, you know, by the Freemasons, the French constructed the so-called Statue of Liberty, which is nothing more than Apollyon or Apollo in disguise. Transgender image of Apollo passed off as a female is a construction in France. More images here. The so-called Statue of Liberty. I'm getting back to the 33 hoax code. Flight 93 in Shanksville. And of course, what do you have? 33 passengers. No plane crash there, of course. Just a quick little reference to 33 being their hoax code. Bill Gates fears global pandemic. This is regarding Ebola. Suppose Ebola virus outbreak could wipe out 33 million. And also the French connection when it comes to 9-11 with the Nade brothers, the French crew, TV crew in New York filming these firefighters during a drill 
Let me fast forward here a little bit. This is the French Connection. And again, the Nade brothers, it's like Illuminate. Always a play with words. This camera crew, of course, being selected because they're French and the names involved. Again, the play on names. And also, this video I uploaded earlier in the week, this was filmed by a French TV crew as well. Of course, Freemasons behind the scenes calling this. I want to point this out. I didn't state in the video with Depeche Mode on top of the Twin Towers. Depeche Mode have nothing to do with the actual lyrics of their songs. There's people behind the scenes that write the song lyrics and they perform the song. Just like the performance on top of the towers was not their doing. There's people behind the scenes, their managers, their agents calling these shots. They're not the ones dictating anything. They are employed by the so-called elite that run the music industry. Well, there it is, the biggest pyramid of Europe. So here in Holland is the biggest pyramid of Europe. It's 36 meters high and has an obelisk on it. It was made by the pharaohs or their descendants for Napoleon and by the General Mormont. There were 18,000 men here. It's next to Utrecht in the middle of the Netherlands. And when Napoleon was in the pyramid in Egypt, he came out, he was completely pale and white and his soldiers asked him, well, sir, what happened? And he said, well, I don't want to tell you because you're not gonna understand. He's a pharaoh. He was a pharaoh and something happened there. So here is the, the forest here all around and uh, yeah, it's an obelisk, it's a pyramid with an obelisk on it, they are here all right, oh yeah. So this thing was built in 1804 by Napoleon and for Napoleon, who felt himself as a pharaoh. Why else? They are here. What more proof do you want? Pyramid and an obelisk. Do you need any more proof? Well, what's a pharaoh show? They're here and they're ruling. So here we're not far away at all of the Bilderberg Hotel where the Bilderbergs with this Prince SS, Prince Bernard, uh, started. So this is the biggest pyramid of Europe, it says. Well, I don't understand everything, but... Uh, it's like two more. And they built it in 1804. It's 36 meters high. Uh, well, Napoleon, he loved pyramids, eh? The pharaohs. Well, I don't understand everything, but what they're saying. There it is, the pyramid with the obelisk on it. The Pharaoh.
cartoon I pet go. Heliophant. Right? And I, we've already looked at the crown of thorns disappearing as the cathedral crumbles. But if we go a little further, we see our, our hero here sailing into this rising sun, the sun of the morning. Both of these represent basically the same entity. Also can be referred to as Helios, the sun of the morning, uh, Lucifer, okay? And we see these three pyramids here, right? Now just check this out. I'd moved all the, the relics, including the crown of thorns, over to the Louvre Museum. And the Louvre Museum is like totally famous for its pyramid. That's what it's famous for. So the crown of thorns went to the pyramid. And the very next scene after the crown of thorns disappears are the pyramids. And if you watch, it starts firing out these fireballs. And it fires this one at the pyramid, knocking off the capstone. And then everything else crumbles. All three of them crumble. And if you were to go to the Louvre, okay, this is very interesting, okay? Uh, that was an, a recent art exhibition they did there. But if you go to the Louvre, that pyramid above ground is also inverted below ground, okay? You got to think about this stuff, along with a small pyramid at the very bottom, okay? Much like how this artist depicted this. This is all artwork here that you can only view from a specific angle. And this was an artwork. Okay, normally you don't see this. Normally you would see just the whole facade here, the whole, you know, thing. It's the Louvre. And sure enough, it hits this pyramid. I just found that to be really strange. Especially if you go to Paris. I mean, it's just off the charts satanic this whole city but especially where the Louvre is the cathedrals over here right on this island the Louvre is right across the river right here and this is the location where all the kings Marie Antoinette and Napoleon and all those you know they ran the show from this area and that pyramid is right here and the real crazy thing is is if you go down this major thoroughfare here you know the the champion parkway whatever it's called and it brings you to the giant arch where trump and all the dignitaries met back on november 11th that big giant arch is right in the middle here and this big spider looking thing okay but back more towards the louvre here they have an obelisk right there as well and it's literally from the luxor in egypt it, it's a, a literal thing in Paris that lines up perfectly with this pyramid that's back here. This is crazy. Pyramid's here. The obelisk is right there. And then you go down to this crazy mad arch, okay? And then down the very end of this is where it's really insane, okay? There's these buildings down here that are just like, so bizarre where this whole thoroughfare ends and this is at is what's at the end of it look at that thing it's a giant portal or doorway a, a cube if you will that is nuts and that's down the very end of this whole craziness i mean this town is just ready for total spiritual warfare man this is steeped in satanic everything. The whole city. Just like New York, Washington, D.C., all of them. It's just crazy. And so, yeah, this all stems from this soul pious, the servant of the sun god, Helios, Heliophant. They moved the artworks to the pyramid. Okay? I mean, this is nuts to me. Really. The more this stuff piles up, the more I'm just like... What is going on here? Notre Dame? I mean, you gotta admit, this is pretty wild stuff, you guys. You gotta admit. But the fact that the crown of thorns is now in the pyramid, essentially, that has a smaller inverted pyramid beneath it, 
and then a small pyramid at the very bottom. I showed you that. Okay, I'll show you again because this stuff is just crazy. Seriously. Right there. It, it depicts it all. Right there. The, all the three pyramids are in one spot. And if you watch, this one explosion destroys all three pyramids. None of the other ones get hit, but they all crumble just the same. Like as if they were under this big one. So I'm kind of thinking like, wow, is something going to happen in Paris? That's my thought. You know, it's just my humble opinion. And I like to give my opinion, especially when it's lead. So. And that precisely, 666 glass panels were used in its construction. This, in fact, was confirmed by an official bulletin, published at the time of the construction of the pyramid, which cited in two cases that, 666 portions of glass would be used in the entire structure. However, the enigmatic pyramid, became more popular thanks to the novel by Dan Brown entitled, The Da Vinci Code, in which the main character, Robert Langdon, talks about the strange desire, of President Mitterrand, to have a glass pyramid of 666 panels built on the outside of the most famous museum in the world. Everything seems to indicate, that the Louvre Pyramid, is much more than an architectural work. And there are many conspiracy theorists, who say that it really is a symbol of the elite. The elite, along with their associates, the Freemasons, have long supported science and have opposed the restrictive reigns of the Christian Church. As such, they have often been qualified, as Satanists. Hey everyone, this is Mike with On Point Preparedness. Today, I have to share with you an incredible prophetic message that I believe was revealed directly to me by the Father. In this video, I will not only share with you the prophetic event that happened between Pope Francis and Donald Trump's May 24th meeting, but how God revealed its significant importance to me. As I write the words to this video, I am still marveling at the circumstances which led me to decipher this event. Many of you who have followed my works for the past year clearly understand that the prophetic chapters of the Bible irrefutably attribute the term Mystery Babylon to an anti-church of the end times, and that this church or false religion is led by the Vatican. It also states that there is a second beast, the beast of the earth, who subdues the world into worshiping the beast system and that beast of the earth is the United States of America. If you are in disagreement with these concepts, or they are completely foreign to you, I have placed some of my most pivotal YouTube videos on this subject in the YouTube description box for your convenience. Ever since the events of September 23rd, 2015, where these two beasts came together for a historic event in which Pope Francis spoke to a joint session of Congress, I have followed the relationship of these entities in detail. Therefore, when Donald Trump took office, I took the position that Donald Trump was not a Christian savior appointed by the Lord, but the new head of the beast of the earth. But have you ever asked God for forgiveness? I'm not sure I have. I just go and try and do a better job from there. I don't think so. I think I, if, I, if I do something wrong, I think I just try and make it right. I don't bring God into that picture. I don't. Now, when I take, you know, when we go and church and, and when I drink my little wine, which is about the only wine I drink, and have my little cracker, I guess that's a form of asking for forgiveness. And I do that as often as possible because I feel cleansed, okay? I stated on record in January 2017 that he and Pope Francis would come together despite opposition from the mainstream media and many of my subscribers who stated that the two were so diametrically opposed 
that they would not meet. And so, here we are, on May 24th, 2017, where these two leaders have come together seeking common goals, that is, the unification of religions in the spirit of peace, solidarity, and combating extremism. All in all, their meeting lasted less than an hour, and on its surface, there was some symbolism that I had anticipated. That is, Trump and his family would submit to Pope Francis. Sure enough, they did so as Melania, Ivanka, and their aide all wore black veils and black dresses, which is a common practice of submission or respect amongst formal female visitors to the Vatican. This is in stark contrast to the fact that none of these women or any of the women in the Trump entourage wore any head covering at all during their visit to Saudi Arabia. However, the symbolism goes much, much deeper than this, and it is in regards to the gift that Donald Trump presented to Pope Francis. So what is this gift and what prophetic significance does it have? First, let me help you understand how God communicates with me and how he said that I must focus on Donald's gift. In running On Point Preparedness, I tirelessly research news articles, books, and even ancient texts. These activities, along with my full-time job, two children, and wife, prevent me from getting back to hobbies and the actual original founding purpose of On Point Preparedness, which was based on wilderness survival. Three days earlier, on May 21st, 2017, with what little free time I had, I picked up the following wild edible book from my collection of about 12 or so wild edible books. Each of these books is several hundred pages long and contain information about hundreds of different plants. I was only able to read a single section about one plant which I had not researched before and that is the North American lotus plant known as the Nambo Lutea. This event by itself is essentially meaningless, that is, until I recognized that one of the gifts that Donald Trump presented to Pope Francis was a bronze sculpture of the exact lotus species I was reading about three days earlier. Is it mere coincidence that of all the gifts that Donald Trump could present to Pope Francis, it would be one species of plant out of several thousands of species of plants. And that I, one who committed to his subscribers that this event would be prophetic and that I would be analyzing the symbolism, would have read about this very same species only three days earlier. So what is the important symbolism? The lotus is one of the most occult and ancient symbols of the natural world. And the fact that Donald Trump chose this sculpture, which was entitled Rising Above, is of grave concern. The lotus is the flower sacred to the Aryan Hindus, Egyptians, Buddhists, and more. References to it are found in the Egyptian Book of the Dead the Jewish mystic religion of Kabbalism, and several other pagan religion texts and sculptures. For the occult, it represents the divine rebirth unto enlightenment, an abstract concept that is brought to life in the concrete or visible form of a lotus. It is, in essence, the same symbolism as the enlightenment of the all-seeing third eye. To name a few examples of its prevalence, you can see this in the occult film I Pet Goat 2, where a lotus flower is seen blooming at the heels of then President Obama. His face grows stark as he witnesses the reality of this transformative stage of enlightenment. In Egypt, you can see here the four sons of Horus being birthed out of the lotus flower. In Buddhism, Buddha is frequently attributed to holding the lotus, and the list goes on and on. 
The reason why the occult reveres this flower and its symbolism of rebirth unto enlightenment is best described by Helena P. Blavatsky, who is the co-founder of the Theosophical Society, and she writes specifically on the lotus flower. For reference, the Theosophical Society shares ideology and partnership with the Lucius Trust, an organization that directly worships Lucifer and states that he is a misrepresented angel that sacrificed himself for the good of mankind. In her book, The Secret Doctrine, she references a passage from the Kabbalistic manuscripts which states, pointing to like signification was the lotus growing in the waters of the Nile. Its mode of growth peculiarly fitted it as a symbol of reproductive activities. The flower of the lotus, which is the bearer of the seed for reproduction, as the result of its maturing, is connected by its placenta-like attachment with Mother Earth, or the womb of Isis, through the water of the womb that is the River Nile, by means of the long cord-like stalk, the umbilicus. Nothing can be plainer than the symbol, and to make it perfect in its intended signification, a child is sometimes represented as seated in or issuing from the flower. So you can now see how the occult viewed the flower as a symbol of rebirth as a child or this rebirth into enlightenment, represented by a child coming out of the flower head. The Kabbalistic manuscript continues with the sexual and reproductive symbolism of the lotus. It states the locality of the womb is to be taken as the most holy place, the sanctum sanctorum, and the veritable temple of the living God. This falls in line with all occult practices as they practice sex magic and literally worship the female body. She also makes note of the lotus from the ancient Egyptian ritual Book of the Dead, which has a section entitled Transformation into the Lotus. It states, a head emerging from this flower, the god exclaims, I am the pure lotus, emerging from the luminous one. I carry the message of Horus. I am the pure lotus which comes from the solar fields. So. I believe that the Antichrist spirit was definitely at work in this meeting. Any multitude of gifts could have been given to Pope Francis. Books, medallions, sentimental items, other pieces of art, etc. But out of these multitudes, Donald Trump chose the Lotus. As the Egyptian Book of the Dead states, is Donald affirming that he carries the message or gift of Horus, an enlightened message essentially from Lucifer? I guess that is up for you to decide. So, let's take you first to the Bank of America mural. There are three paintings that are prominently featured in the Bank of America Corporate Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. This fresco was created by artist Benjamin F. Long. Let's begin with one of the murals. In the final sequence of the murals, we see the surviving blue-collar population at the bottom. Notice there are 13 men working below to acquire the wealth of the elite. The shovels that they hold are have heads that are rich gold in color, suggesting gold as the resource to secure and by the way 13 is the occult number. At the next level above the ground is the higher level educated skilled worker who is rebuilding the new world while the elite giant is restfully sleeping above in the hills suggesting his secret control. The picture suggests a rebuilding era due to the clean landscapes. This is the final era of the elite after many on the earth have been eliminated and the new world is underway. In this mural, the back wall, as you'll notice, has a barbed wire and 
the elite above are circling in alchemical flames in naked freedom and power while being separated from the chaos below the net. Key characters in the crowd are hazmat and marines carrying rifles. There is an active burning industrial building if you look in the background suggesting a crematory. And you see to the right at the top the Nazi gold eagle and flags that are red, white, and blue with blank street signs and protest signs that are blank suggesting that the people have no voice and no answers. There's more details to the mural. In this mural there is the Masonic checker floor as part of the landscape along with the blonde haired blue eyed Aryan youth in the Masonic heel to heel 90 degree stance representing a new generation. The burning bush in the background is blowing exactly westward indicating that the western world is being burned. You see the close up. The white male right next to the burning bush wearing a red sweater and blue jeans and reading a book is casually aware of the burning bush. Masonic rituals depict initiates especially those of the 33rd degree as revered and being near the burning bush. The woman inside a transparent cube is being drawn by the electromagnetic energy of the black sun at the top. Politicians are arguing their explanations. So let's talk about in more detail the figure in the trench coat, the prince, the order of the garter. A young boy is dressed in a long dark double-breasted trench coat resembling Prince William, Duke of Cambridge, KG, born June the 21st, 1982. That is a significant date as you will see later. He is the elder son of Charles, Prince of Wales, and the late Diana, Princess of Wales, and third eldest grandchild of Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. He is the second in the line of succession behind his father. A clue that this depiction is Prince William are the wrinkles in his right coat sleeve that spell out William, as you can see below. In the mural, Prince William is wearing the Order of the Garter on his head, on his crest, and that is the crown crest, which is a gold lion, as in the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. A near identical image of William at the bottom is found on the Denver Airport mural as well. And in that mural, he's holding an anvil that was a sword that is now representing peace. The Order of the Garter was founded by Edward III in 1348, known as the Black Prince. It will be 666 years of the Order's existence in the year 2014. And on June the 13th, 2011, in Windsor, England, Prince William was named the 1,000th member in over a 600-year period of the Order of the Garter. The Order of the Garter, eight-pointed star, is worn on the left breast and it has a 13 stone ruby cross center. So let's talk about Prince William and his lineage to King David. The Black Prince, King Edward III, was the very first Knight of the Garter. He comes directly from the lineage of King David, thereby qualifying him to be accepted by the rabbis as in the lineage of the Messiah. But he also comes from the lost tribe of Dan, Dan was the fifth son of Jacob, and the tribe is also represented by the six-pointed star of David and a serpent. The marriage of Charles to Diana was extremely important because Diana brought one aspect of the Merovingian bloodline back to the English crown. In marrying Prince Charles, William is the first child to claim lineage from every English king who has left descendants. Prince William is not a confirmed Freemason, but has many Masonic relatives, 
Kings and Dukes were Grand Masters of Masonic Lodges. The last Grand Master, who rules the United Grand Lodge of England, is H.R.H. Duke of Kent, cousin of Queen Elizabeth II and uncle of Prince William. Now as you look at the coat of arms at the bottom, Itch is in the left design and Dn is in the right design. Itch represents the Black Prince, Dn the Red Dragon, and together they can read, I, the Black Prince, serve the Red Dragon. And we know who the Red Dragon is. So, Prince Charles's coat of arms represents the Red Dragon. In Revelation 13, 1, And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns, seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Now, of significance to that is that at his coronation, in 1969, and we're talking about Prince Charles, the father, he sat on a chair with a large red dragon emblazoned on it. During the ceremony, his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, said, This dragon gives you your power, your throne, and your own authority. His response to her was, and I quote, I am now your liege man and worthy of your earthly worship. Liege is an old English word meaning Lord, meaning I am now your Lord man and worthy of your earthly worship. And also as you can see here, the crest of the Knights Templar is showing the same symbols as did Prince Charles when he received this coronation. So the origin and meaning of the red dragon symbol goes beyond the coat of arms. You see it here in the flag of Wales, the red dragon, and that means the place of the strangers or foreigners. That is, as in the tribe of Dan, importing themselves to Wales. And then you see it on the airplane of Wales, the same red dragon. And then we see it in the 1953 Royal Badge of Wales. And notice that there is a circle around the dragon that gives the letters Y Drag Gotch Didri Sichuan and it means the red dragon should go forward. This is the unofficial Welsh national model. Sometimes it is described as the red dragon will rise again or the red dragon will lead the way. And I believe this is all symbolic of what is to come in the time of tribulation with the Antichrist. As you look in detail now at the seal of Prince Charles, the father, here's what you see in detail. But let's first look at the text, Revelations 12:3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And then Revelation 13:1. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were the ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And so as you look at Prince Charles, the father, his seal, his coat of arms, you notice that the crown actually is shown here in seven places and they're all numbered. You see it in the lion figure, you see it above that represents the son, uh, the son Prince Char uh, William, you see the crown of the face, you see the crown on the unicorn, you see the crown in the center of the shield, and you see two more crowns below. There are your seven heads with seven crowns. Also, we discussed how, in this text, that the beast would resemble a leopard, and which this does by its, its length and its thinness as compared to a lion. It has the feet of a bear, and if you look at the feet, those are bare feet, and it has the mouth as a lion, and it certainly has a lion's mouth. So let's focus on 
the lion, leopard, bear, beast on the left. Notice there are three parallel horns on his neck, which are, in a manner of speaking, plucked out by the roots, which means turned upside down. Then come to the center photo. The helm, which is the face, has seven curved bars or horns. These seven horns, along with the three horns from the eldest son, lion, at the top, make a total of ten horns in the head region. And from Daniel 7 verse 8, I consider the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So as you can see in the first two photos, we have numbered the three additional horns to the seven that already existed in the previous slide. Now, let's take a look at the eyes of a man in the horn. Over on the next photo is the unicorn. In heraldry, the unicorn's eyes are round and black. There are no visible eye whites. Queen Elizabeth's heraldic unicorn is depicted just like that, no visible eye whites. But Charles's design here shown has the eyes shaped more like those of a human with noticeable eye whites. Daniel 7, 8. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man. Also in heraldry, this unicorn represents not only Scotland, but also a counterfeit Christ. Let's take it further. The unicorn of the prince. The constellation Monoceros, which is the unicorn, is in the winter's great triangle, as you see above in the skies, formed by the bright stars Betelgeuse, Sirius, and Procyon. Monoceros is on the celestial equator between Orion, which is where God comes through, and Hydra, which is where the dragon is. And it contains exactly 66 naked eye stars. Monoceros forms the square and the compasses. The square is at 90 degrees and the compass is at 55 degrees. In ancient Egypt, the plum rule was called a merket. The merket was used in conjunction with a plumb line to measure the positions of stars and their corresponding positions on the ground in Egypt. Our winter sky is dominated by Orion, but the creature that is following him, tracking his every movement across the celestial sphere, mimicking him, is Monoceros, the unicorn. And who does the unicorn represent? Prince Charles and Prince William. In the photo to the left, which is a hieroglyph, the horn of Monoceros points to the silver gate of man. And Enki, who is in this hieroglyph, is stepping in the direction of where the unicorn horn is pointing. And you see his foot on top of the unicorn horn. And he has a bird in his hand. The bird is the constellation Corvus, Latin for raven or crow. It sits on the tail of Hydra, the sea dragon, as you can see above, and it includes 11 stars visible to the naked eye. It belonged to Apollo, that is the bird, Apollo the god of light, which the Bible calls Apollyon the destroyer. Enki is the one of the four gods known as the Anunnaki, who were Sumerians. Anunnaki were associated with the Nephilim giants of the Bible. And then up above, his left foot is on the horn of the unicorn, as if he is rising up from the unicorn out of the waters. The ancients believed that the Milky Way was the celestial river in the heavens, and Monoceros is on the celestial equator of the Milky Way. The Winged Savior. Prince Charles was presented with a model of the sculpture unveiled on March the 6th, 2002, and Prince Charles was here called the Winged Hero. It is a giant bronze statue of Prince Charles as a winged hero, quote-unquote, saving the world. It is to become the centerpiece of a remote Amazonian town in Brazil. And then there are many identifiers of Prince Charles 
relative to the number 666, the number of the beast, the number of the Antichrist. And here they are, eight in number. Charles, in English and French, comes from the Germanic name Carl, which was derived from a Germanic word which meant man, for it is the number of a man, that is the 666. Prince Charles was granted his heraldic achievement, or coat of arms, at the age of 13, the occult number. The Red Dragon of Wales, under which he serves, Itchy itch Dien means I serve, and he pronounced that at his coronation. He claims descent from Israel's King David, Jesus, and Islam's Muhammad, as well as the tribe of Dan, and all of those are in the lineage of Christ but this is the Antichrist. 4. He will be the first living member of the royal family to have a life-size statue dedicated in his honor in Brazil as Savior of the World. 5. He was born in 1948, the same year that Israel became a modern nation. 6. His name can be calculated to the numerical value of 666 by the ancient Hebrew method in both English and in Hebrew. 7. His coat of arms shows the past emperors of the Roman Empire of Iron, Leopard, the feet of a bear, and the mouth of a lion. And 8. Prince Charles has declared that as king, he will be known as the defender of faith, that is, as in all faiths, bringing them together. So, the coming world leader, commonly known as the Antichrist, has 33 titles in the Old Testament and 13 in the New Testament. How interesting. 33 has become the Masonic highest order number and it is a number of sacrifice and 13 is the occult number. Daniel reveals a second prince who shall later arrive. With Daniel 9.26 we have a specific reference to the prince that shall come after the Messiah is cut off. A prince whose people are not only associated with the destruction of the city, that is Jerusalem, and the sanctuary, that is the holy temple, but who are also associated with wars and desolations unto the end. This prophecy is referring to a future time when the Antichrist, often referred to as the little prince, the little horn, and later as king, rises out of the empire which was once ancient Rome and now Europe, taking his rightful seat of authority, the power of his kingship, and the crown of the red dragon. So note that the eldest son lion is around the neck of the dragon. You see that those three lines around the neck of the dragon, thus associating Prince William with his father Prince Charles and the dragon. Prince William will become the Prince of Peace. Daniel 11.22 The overflowing forces will be flooded away before him and shattered and also the Prince of the Covenant. After an alliance is made with him he will practice deception and he will go up and gain power with a small force of people. In a time of tranquility he will enter the richest parts of the realm and he will accomplish what his fathers never did nor his ancestors. He will distribute plunder, booty, and possessions among them and he will devise his schemes against strongholds but only for a time. So when it says he will accomplish what his fathers never did nor his ancestors it is most likely referring to the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem in a supposed time of peace and that is why in the Denver mural above he is holding what was a sword of war with what has been turned into a symbol of peace Absolutely, the quality of the fruits. 
Congratulations. Hey folks, everything new and sun. Here is some fascinating conjecture. Something interesting about Macron, about specifically what he said. Now, of course, we all know that uh, French President uh, Macron says he'll rule like the Roman god Jupiter. And this is from mrctv.org. Um, there's also uh, Breitbart. You can go to all sorts of outlets and uh, see where he said that. So Kent's speaking about the history of the church and the, the temple. The second temple was desecrated. And it was uh, desecrated by Antiochus. Um, and so it, it starts here. Antiochus did indeed desecrate the temple in Jerusalem on December 25th, 168 BC, by setting up a statue of Zeus, Olympus, some say Jupiter. Remember we just said that Macron wanted to rule like a Roman god Jupiter, uh, resembling Antiochus. He then sacrificed a pig on the altar. It remained desolate for three years. What does the Bible say about the end time and the third temple? The, uh, at the uh, halfway point, the Antichrist, which uh, reveals himself basically at the start of the seventy tribulation, will at the halfway mark uh, desecrate the, the, the temple, the abomination of desolation, where he sits on the throne in the third temple as God. And uh, so who is that uh, Antichrist figure going to be? Well, if uh, the history is just a rehearsal what has happened in the past a rehearsal what for what's to happen in the future antiochus basically set up a, a statue uh, of zeus or jupiter uh in the temple to desecrate it. that's one of the things that desecrated it and what do we see here now we see another person today who is a leader of uh, france who says he wants to rule like a roman god who better who, uh, I mean, if he were the Antichrist, he would fit in quite well because he would be uh, like the Greek god Jupiter uh, if he desecrated the temple, sat on the throne in the temple. So what does... Uh, uh, go away, Perrier. I want to go to uh, this one here. Who is uh, Jupiter? Let's go to Bible history first. So here's the uh, proof, BibleHistory.com, so you know uh, we're not making this stuff up. All right, so this is... Like I say, BibleHistory.com, Antiochus uh, the Fourth Epiphanes bust, his bust there. Antiochus uh, the Fourth, 175 to 164, was the eighth ruler of the Seleucid em uh, Empire. He gave himself the surname Epiphanes, which means the visible God, that he and Jupiter were identical. So uh, he desecrated the temple, the second temple. So wouldn't it stand a reason that uh, someone claiming to be uh, the God Jupiter, um, this guy thought he was the God Jupiter, the visible God Jupiter, uh, wouldn't it be interesting that uh, another person claiming to be uh, the god Jupiter or like the god Jupiter, the apparent, you know, there is no god Jupiter, but like the Greek god Jupiter. Wouldn't it be interesting if the, uh, the uh, not the dress rehearsal, but the actual live performance, uh, the end of the, uh, you know, the end of the book, the end of the world situation, the desecration of the third temple, the person who sits on it, wouldn't it be interesting if that person uh, described himself as um, the god Jupiter, or like the god Jupiter. He acted as though he really were Jupiter, and the people called him uh, Apimanes, meaning the madman. He was violently bitter against the Jews and was determined to exterminate them and the religion. He devastated Jerusalem in 168 BC, just like we read in, in Ken Hovind's uh, What on Earth book that we're covering. Defiled the temple, offered a pig on its altar, erected an altar to Jupiter, prohibited temple worship, forbade circumcision on the pain of death, sold thousands of Jewish families into slavery, and it goes on. So uh, when the Antichrist desecrates the third temple, um, again, um, these are dress rehearsals. These things have happened in the past, 168 BC into the second temple. This is a dress rehearsal of what's to come. So the fact that uh, we have um, uh, Macron saying, I want to rule like a Roman uh, god, uh, let's go to, this is uh, Breitbart here. Let me see if I can uh, pull this up here. Uh, Emmanuel Bonaparte, Macron declares he will govern like a Roman god. There he is, uh, the guy himself. Could that be the Antichrist? Some, someone's going to be the Antichrist uh, one of these years in history. And uh, we're getting pretty close to the end times. Next we see representatives from different monotheistic religions come together to perform a ritual. Judaism, Christianity, although it looks Catholic, and Islam are being represented here. The ritual was done as a service to those who lost their lives while building the tunnel. Nevertheless, it's hard to think that this isn't part of the move towards a one-world religious system. Then, we watched as really important people 
started showing up to the event. A group of folks even came in a helicopter. The outdoor location of the beginning of the ceremony had a spinning wheel, probably representing the drill they used to build the tunnel, but then again, it can have more significance in terms of a gateway about to be opened. Once everyone filed inside, the place went dark and the ceremony got started. Eventually, the president of the railroad company came out to speak to the crowd. Sitting in the front row is this guy, who's got the staff that has a strange goat head, which is clearly in reference to Cernunos, the horned god. Aside from the obvious fact that the name has Cern in it, Cernunos is a god found in Celtic mythology. He is the god of fertility and vegetation, and is considered the lord of the forest and master of the hunt. He also has a connection to Pan, the Greek satyr, which is interesting because the location where Jesus declared that the gates of hell won't prevail against the kingdom of God, he was standing in front of the grotto of Pan. Cernunos is also associated with Wicca, as it is also a wing of paganism. And as we will come to see, this horned god becomes the center of the ceremony ritual. We then see five horses with a carriage and a trumpet sound to signal the performance part of the ceremony. Interestingly, this ceremony cost 8 million euros to make, which is a lot, but not compared to the 8 billion it took to build the tunnel. The BBC explained that the ceremony was celebrating Alpine culture and history, which tells of a story of Swiss villagers who asked the devil to build a bridge so they could cross over the mountain range. The devil agreed under one condition, that he would receive the soul of the first person to cross the bridge. Once the bridge was completed, the villagers sent a goat across the bridge instead of a person. Well, this really upset the devil, and the devil decided to crush them with a large boulder. But after a woman put a mark of the cross on the rock, the devil was unable to touch it, and the devil descended back into the mountain. While this is the public story, what I and many others believe this performance represents is the release of the devil from the underworld, and it will become evident as we go along here. This is the point when the ritual becomes truly bizarre. Cernunos is known as the fertility god, and this depiction seems to indicate this aspect of his deity. In terms of the narrative for the story being told here, these dancing underwear folks either represent trapped souls underground or simply the fallen spirits that reside in the underworld themselves. And the central character of this bizarre train is this baby angel thing. It looks like the person playing this character is a female who is wearing the mask but is topless. And this sort of gender blending is consistent with the occult perspective as we see male figures with female attributes or androgynous entities in the occult such as Baphomet. And perhaps this represents the angel that can appear as an angel of light as Satan is described in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14. Next, we see a man with chains on his hands trying to break out. Again, on one level, this probably represents the workers that were deep underground and perhaps trapped as a result of their work. But this imagery to fallen angels being trapped in the underworld and Cernunos being the god of the underworld is difficult to overlook. 2 Peter 2.4 says, For if God spared not the angels that had sinned, but cast them down into hell or Tartarus and delivered them into chains of darkness to be kept unto damnation. Could this passage be revealing to us and exposing what this portion of the presentation represents? Then we have the arrival of what I believe are nature spirits being represented and among them is Cernunos. After a long dance, Cernunos and the spirits are confronted with the living who offer their sacrifice. 
Now these images are undoubtedly disturbing and it looks worse because I've sped up the video. And here we see clearly the message being that these entities are trying to ascend from the underworld and they're doing so with the rituals of the people and their sacrifices allowing them to open the abyss and come to the surface. One of the sacrifices is depicted as a lamb and the red-headed giant figures definitely echoes modern witness accounts of the Nephilim. After this chaotic section of the ceremony, we see a yodler and another goat lead into industrialism or civilization. You have the military represented, you have the people represented, and you even have the Pope represented. The elements of nature worship are pretty clear and continue throughout. As the parade leaves the underworld into the surface world, they celebrate with the image of the woman in red, who we will see again later. And if you thought that was weird, wait till we see all the stuff that they did above the ground. First, the workers are back, and it shows them opening up into the mountain and starting to drill, which interestingly has the breaking away of the rocks and then a spinning circle motif that becomes common to the rest of this section of the ceremony. Now, as the dance goes on, the members here, the workers, become more and more tribal to the point where they all pull off their clothes, they're back in their skivvies. I don't know why, but it keeps happening. The sequence that shows three workers turn into three spirits is very interesting. Once they became spirits, it appears that the underworld opened up into the outer world and these spirits manifest and it opens up the gateway to allow through Cernunos and the gang. And isn't it interesting that in Revelation 16, 13, it says, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. We then see the three beetles. Now, beetles in Egyptian mythology and Gnostic teachings signifies immortality and regeneration which is interesting because this is exactly what we saw here being represented and perhaps what is happening here is that beings like Cernunos, demons, fallen angels are trying to display their immortality by regenerating into our world again as they once did in the past. There are several things to notice here. The eyes all around being a spiritual motif that we find on angels in the Bible. But then it gets even worse. The images here of bestiality remind me explicitly of Genesis 6 and the accounts of the sons of God, the daughters of men, and the producing of the Nephilim. The last part of this ceremony shows the people from the crowd come forward and all gather at the world tree, an upside down tree, clearly indicating the underworld. The primitive sticks and rocks turn into a mechanical opening, a gateway. As the gears turn and the portal opens, they arrive in a location where the girl in red is back, but this time she is pregnant. The following section is so graphic that it's not worth showing, but needless to say, the celebration continues. 
Eventually, as the clock starts to count down, their attention is turned to it. But as they near the clock, time starts bending and changing, and eventually we see the people fall to their knees and bow down to time. This is a very interesting gesture, perhaps to the god Kronos. But maybe they were just excited about the train arriving at the other side of the tunnel. What does any of this have to do with CERN? Again, not just the geographical location that's so close, but if you think about the ideologies and philosophies that undergird CERN, not only from the scientific perspective, but what many believe to be the occult or hidden agenda, then what you just saw through this ceremony makes a lot of sense because it would enhance those particular thought forms and energies that they are trying to conjure. In other words, this ceremony was a mass public ritual, not unlike all the mystery religious symbolism we've seen in major public events out here in the West. This is another example of the common philosophies that tie all these things together, which is rooted in the mystery religions and the belief systems that not just oppose to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but in fact glorifies the fallen one as their God. He who occupies the top of those mountains can literally shape the agenda that, that forms nations. This crusade, crusade, this war on terrorism. The Knights Templars. In Jerusalem, the Templars began to deviate further and further away from the practices of Christianity. They learned the secret arts of the Kabbalah, an ancient form of Jewish magic, along with its dark rites and rituals. In 1717, the Templars made their reappearance in Europe. They had grown in both number and strength, and were now ready to coin a new identity, free from their reputation of the past, and given credibility by none other than the monarchy and aristocracy of England. And the name they chose for themselves was a name that will be known by many, but understood by a few. This new name, the Freemasonry. Now, at its very core, this issue seems to tie right into the Knights Templar. And I know that sounds very strange from the get-go, but honestly, this, this deception that's coming into the church is actually tied to the Jesuit Knights Templar, the government of the Order of the Temple of Solomon. I mean, not only are we in the time where everyone's saying, you know, is there going to be a third temple and then in 2013 it comes to light here that the Knights Templar are back um, you know for not that they ever went away but they've come back into the public light the sovereign magistral order of the Temple of Solomon 2013 AD it's fully restored as an independent sovereign subject of international law in 2013 embodying the authentic Templar heritage and we literally have a whole website here which is dedicated to all of these official documents legal documents mind you and the missions this is what I want to show you this Templar spirituality and this is how this links with this deception that we're seeing, the worship of the goddess, the reverence of the divine feminine, Gaia. The temple rule proves that the Knights Templar were always dedicated to honoring the divine feminine principle as the spiritual feminine aspect of God. So you can see how this ties to the Roman Catholic Church, to the Jesuits, to Allah, the moon goddess, and to all of these false religions, but also this pagan new age, which is actually the old age Babylon agenda. Um, and the throwing out of this masculine, we you know we see all these attacks on God and, and um, the Old Testament and the truth of God and, and turning into this airy fairy, emotional, experiential deal without boundaries, without restrictions, without commands. 
Uh, and all of this stuff is tying into when you come to its very core, the conspiracy at its very heart of the New World Order, the Antichrist, the Paganism, the, the Babylon agenda, New World Order, is actually rooted in the Knights Templar, who never went away, but now in 2013 have officially come out into the public and declared themselves sovereign, uh, a sovereign entity without territory, but sovereign nonetheless. So it's all about Gnosticism and Christian mysticism. The Divine Feminine. The uniquely ancient and diverse heritage of Templar spirituality was fully disclosed to the Vatican and officially endorsed by the Roman Catholic Church. Authentic Templar spirituality is a form of esoteric Gnosticism which is wholly compatible with the canonical Christian mysticism of classical Catholicism. Gnostic spirituality primarily concentrates on personal divine communion through the Holy Spirit. Here we go, look, Templar chivalry, look at this. This is the picture of the Pope with all the, the world leaders of religions, of false religions. Hinduism, Islam, Baha'i. And this is what they are showing. And at the bottom of the page we can see all of these emblems which say a lot pontifical protection recognized by five Vatican papal bulls as Templar guardians of the church cooperation with Islam look at that cooperation with Islam as a tool of the Jesuit Knights Templar look at this the Knights of Saladin under Templar sovereign patronage Diplomatic relations with the United Nations, with the crest of Rome. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Governor Peabody, members of the faculty, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to come back to a city where my accent is considered normal. they pronounce the words the way they are spelled. I take a special satisfaction in this day as the recipient of an honorary degree in 1956 from Boston College and therefore an instant alumnus. I am uh, particularly pleased to be with all of you on uh, this uh, most felicitous occasion. This university or college, as Father Walsh has described, was founded in the darkest days of the Civil War when this nation was engaged in a climactic struggle to determine whether it would be half slave and half free or all free. And now 100 years later, after the most intense century perhaps in human history, we are faced with the great question of whether this world will be half slave and half free or whether it will be all one or the other. A war for the Planet of the Apes. Uh, a new start, a new leader will emerge. Guess who that? Guess who the leader of the Planet of the Apes is? is oh. His name is Caesar. It's picked for a reason. They're saying they're just telling you subtle ways uh, all through uh, the movies and media. And on this occasion, as in 1863, the services of Boston College are still greatly needed. It is good also to participate in this ceremony which has honored three distinguished citizens of the free world, President Pusey, Father Bunn, and our friend from the world of freedom, Lady Jackson. Boston College is a hundred years old, old by the lifespan of men, but young by that of universities. In this week of observance, you have rightly celebrated the achievements of the past. And equally rightly, you have turned in a series of discussions by outstanding scholars to the problems of the present and the future. Learned men have been talking here of the knowledge explosion, 
and in all that they have said, I am sure they have implied the heavy present responsibility of institutions like this one. Yet today I want to say a word on the same theme, to impress upon you as urgently as I can the growing and insistent importance of universities in our national life. I speak of universities because that is what Boston College has long since become. But most of what I say applies to liberal arts colleges as well. My theme is not limited to any one class of universities, public or private, religious or secular. Our national tradition of variety in higher education shows no sign of weakening. And it remains the task of each of our institutions to shape its own role among its differing systems. In this hope, I am much encouraged by a reading in this last week of the remarkable encyclical, Pachim in Terror. In its penetrating analysis of today's great problems of social welfare and human rights, of disarmament and international order and peace, that document surely shows that on the basis of one great faith and its tradition, there can be developed counsel on public affairs that is of value to all men and women of goodwill. As a Catholic, I am proud of it. And as an American, I have learned from it. Under the sumptuous dome of Les Avalides in Paris, Napoleon Bonaparte's tomb, 200 years after his death, the French president led commemorations for one of France's most famous leaders. Emmanuel Macron said Napoleon was a brilliant general, a visionary who transformed France, but that it was also time to acknowledge some of the more brutal aspects of his rule. De l'Empire. Nous avons renoncé au pire. We have renounced the worst of the empire and embraced the best of the emperor. To commemorate this bicentenary is to say this, simply, serenely, without giving into anachronism, which would consist of judging the past with the laws of the present. Napoleon forged his destiny in the French Revolution. A gifted military leader and fiercely ambitious, he was crowned emperor at 35 and went on to dominate Europe. He created many of France's institutions and his Napoleonic code still defined civil law. But his lust for power cost many lives. Napoleon Bonaparte was a deeply complex person, both a progressive and an autocrat, so how he should be remembered increasingly divides people in France. The western port of Nantes was the centre of France's slave trade. Abolished during the French Revolution, Napoleon reinstated slavery in France's colonies in 1802. It's a part of Napoleon's legacy that campaigner Michel Cocotier says was ignored for too long. It's very important to have these keys to understand history as it, as it is and not as, it, as we would like it to be. I think, I think this uh, uh, new way to look at what the past was is, is, a, is, a, is the right way to understand what the present is and what the future could be. Whether regarded as a tyrant or genius, fascination with Napoleon endures. And this is a letter that Napoleon wrote while he was on St. Helena. Yeah. Um, I will show you. So it's very rare. It's very, very rare. Letters like this one written by Napoleon three years before his death during his exile on the island of St. Helena are much sought after by collectors. A myth surrounds his character. It's his glory, his military aura. It's why he captivates people around the world. Macron says it's essential not to erase history, but to face it. By frankly addressing the many facets of Napoleon's rule, he's broken with previous French presidents. Reassessing Napoleon's legacy may frustrate some, but it can also offer a richer understanding of France's past. Napoleon, Alexander the Great, Donald Trump, we're all cut from the same cloth. This morning, the Trump campaign revealing the endorsement of 88 retired U.S. generals and admirals. The group signing a letter that in part rips the Obama administration, quote, America's armed forces have been subjected to a series of ill-considered and debilitating budget cuts. With me now is one of the 88 military officials who signed that letter, retired Brigadier General Remo Butler. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Carol. How are you this morning? 
I'm good. Um, wh I'm good, and thank you so much for being here. Why did you throw your support behind Donald Trump? I threw my support behind Donald Trump primarily because of some of the military people that he has surrounded himself with. And when I say that, I'm not saying it lightly. I'm saying that Donald Trump has surrounded himself with what I consider military leaders, warriors. You guys know what this represents? Well, the memories of the calm before the storm. What's the storm? Could be the calm, the calm before the storm. <laughs> What storm is We have the world's great military people in this room, I will tell you that. And uh, we're going to have a great evening. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. What storm, Mr. President? You'll find out. Do you really believe the stories about the beast? understand now the beast is real This before September 2044. Well, I have been researching the 923 code because it is significant with the birthing of Jupiter 923-2017. He's the king of the gods and represents the Antichrist in a way. But 923 also represents 14. And we know that Osiris was cut up into 14 pieces from his brother Set, who is also the brother of Horus. So this code is really a code that has been broken down with many things. And most of all, it's been broken down with unity because what they want to do is put the pieces of Osiris back together again, just like in our last show, Isis is representing the moon. Osiris represents the sun and she wants to put all the pieces of Osiris back together again. When Chekhov saw the long winter, he saw a winter bleak and dark and bereft of hope. Yet we know that winter is just another step in the cycle of life. She called us, Miss, Thursday morning, 9.23. I thought, okay, this is it, here we go. Do you believe this? I don't, I, I don't know what's going on. You never know what's going on. Thank you. Agent Dunham, I need immediate evac. 923 Church Street. There's a device on the 47th floor. Nicely done. I'm going to take you back to 2004 to a movie called God Sent. Okay? The movie is God Sent. Now, this is also a play on words. Also, how the elite work. Also, this is very important. When I say a person, oh man, you are a God Sent. Oh man, she showed up. Man, you're a God Sent. That means that you're, man, I'm blessed. I, I'm glad you showed up. You saved the day. You're a godsend. Okay. Now, this is very important is if I say to you just simply godsend, G O D S E N D, godsend, separate it, God's end. So it's the same word, but pronounced or said another way and how you perceive it. 
God's end, God's sin. So it's one way is viewed as sounds great. The other doesn't sound so great. Uh, here's another example. I'm going to say a statement, and then based on how you perceive it and how where your mind is at the time, you will hear it a different way. Not everybody will agree when they hear it. And here's the statement. I won't sin. I won't sin. Okay? Now, you can perceive that as I won't or I will not sin. Okay? I will not sin. I won't sin. Or, I won't sin. I-W-A-N-T, sin. See? Depending on how you perceive it, it's two different outcomes. Same statement, but perceived two different ways. And there's a lot of that going on in today's media, music, movies, everywhere. Perceiving it. Um, that's why conspiracies are right out in the open. They're not hiding anything. It's how you're taught to see them and perceive them and read them. That's the only really difference. Um, and I, I don't understand why certain people can't see it, um, but I understand how the, the secret societies and, and things, how they work. So let's go back to God in 2004. It's about a couple. They agree their deceased son. They're going to have him clone, bring him back from the dead uh, years after, like a rebirth, resurrection again, okay? God's end. So they're telling you something actually in the title, two, two things. And, and, it, and it's very, very subtle um, to catch it, but like the tagline even tells you is, when a miracle becomes a nightmare, evil is born. See, there's a miracle mixed with a nightmare, the two. It is also the dark and the light, the, the black and the white, the Masonic. There's something that's not right. There's something that is right, but it's not quite right. Um, and they're telling you things. Is It's a godsend. It's great. Or it's God's end, which is terrible. And what are they talking about here? Same thing I'm showing you is there's coming a time where the body, which once you realize we are the temple of God, Sorry, folks, if you don't believe in that, I'm sorry. But this is the ultimate game. This is it, guys, the one game. Is if once you understand where the enemy is focused, it is us. It is the temple of God, humanity, uh, the human brain, mind, all of this stuff for your soul. Okay. So the, the, the resurrecting the son, Adam, going to resurrect him. But here's where I'm going to connect some more dots for you guys. Everybody made plenty of videos, and they have over the years, this year it's no different, of 923, 923. Listen to me, people. 923, September 23. Do you understand? I'm going to tell you why you see this all over the place and the number of 923. This, listen, this is it. I'm telling you, is in prophecy the secret societies, the Freemasons, Rosicrucianers, they all believe in a last kingdom that will be resurrected. Even in the Holy Bible, the last kingdom of iron and clay is a Holy Roman Empire. That's why it's sitting around this country. We still have pieces of it. The Senate, the Hill. You look on the municipal buildings, they have Roman gods everywhere. Um, it is a resurrected Roman Empire, and the first Roman Emperor was Augustus Caesar, okay? He was born, here we go, September 23rd, 63 B.C., 6 3, 3 is 666, I mean, it, it's all intertwined. He is the first Roman Emperor. That's why that's dedicated that number that that's on that day. And they believe in a resurrected Roman Empire for a reason. Uh, the Holy Roman Empire, the imperial banner, is the double eagle. 
Get it, folks. Double Eagle, Double Phoenix doesn't matter. It's all the same. A resurrect, a new world order. Um, it, you know, it, it's all the same. And they believe in that one day that it will be resurrected. It's in the works now. That's why they do what they what they're doing. Um, and here you go. Listen, I go even further here. Adam Duncan. Here's the tagline. It's even on the movie poster. I don't know if you can see. I, fi- I couldn't find a good copy of it. He was born December 11th, 1987. He died December 12th, 1995. He was reborn September 23rd. Are you seeing here they're telling you something? Is That's it. They believe um, Adam Duncan going to be reborn. He's going to be a duplicate, an antichrist, born 923. But even if I can't predict where you are, I can turn the walls to glass. I should thank you. I'd almost forgotten the excitement of not knowing. The delights of uncertainty. Forgive me, girl. Less obvious heroism. Your schoolboy heroics are redundant. What have they achieved? Failing to prevent Earth's salvation is your only triumph. I'm disappointed in you, Adrian. I'm very disappointed. Reassembling myself was the first trick I learned. It didn't kill Osterman. Did you really think it would kill me? I have walked across the surface of the sun. I have witnessed events so tiny and so fast, they can hardly be said to have occurred at all. But you, Adrian, are just a man. The world's smartest man poses no more threat to me than does its smartest termite. What's that? Another ultimate weapon? Yes. You could say that. Another attack. Millions of lives were suddenly ended an act of evil perpetrated by Dr. Manhattan himself.
know these things are coming, but we don't fixate on them all the time. What we do is we, we want to keep our focus on Christ. When you're not fearful and you find your place in Christ, Psalm 91 is a great prayer of protection for the Christian believer that if you claim that scripture for yourself and dwell in the hiding place of Jesus Christ, he will protect you. There's promises in that scripture for you. Just lean on Christ, surrender to Christ, believe that Christ and everything he says he means, and they're all promises that you can take to the bank. And we will persevere and stand in this time. It's the greatest time to be alive. It's the greatest time to be witnessing the return of Jesus Christ. It's the greatest time in human history. We're going to see stuff that is beyond amazement. And we're going to see the destruction of the beast system once and for all. I'm looking forward to just fellowshipping with Christ and my fellow believers in Christ during this period of time for whatever he has in store for each one of us. Seek Jesus in the morning.